Brian Mitchell is currently serving the fifth year of a 30-year jail sentence. The only way out for him is amnesty. When he submitted his application in Peter Maritzburg this week, he didn't deny his guilt. Instead, he explained how the 11 murders he was convicted for were committed with a political motive. The police, he said, made him into a murderer and arsonist and then used him in the battle to win every inch of Natal for Inkata. On the 2nd of December 1988, 11 Inkata supporters attending a night vigil were shot dead in Trust Feed Natal. The victims were mostly women and children. Local police made no progress in finding the killers. Then Frank Dutton of the investigation's task unit got involved. Dutton nailed seven policemen, including none other than the new Hanover Police Station commander, Captain Brian Mitchell. In 1992, Justice Andrew Wilson was the man who sentenced Mitchell to death. This week, it was Judge Wilson's task to consider setting him free. How did a policeman charged with the task of protecting this village end up charged with the murder of 11 of its residents? Up to 1988, Brian Mitchell's story is the story of hundreds of young white South African men. He joined the police force when he was just 18 years old. During his training in 1976, he was attached to a riot unit in Soweto. Later, he spent time at Malieskop, a police counterinsurgency base, and in 1982, he was called upon to use that training in Evombaland against Swapo. In his affidavit to the Amnesty Committee, Mitchell explained how he was fed and accepted a particular view of the world. It is only recently that he has slipped the bounds of that deep, blind loyalty he says was instilled in him and expected by the police force. Just as many uh, young black men from South Africa fled during the 1976 period and who were eventually trained as ANC terrorists, as I and many others then saw it, so my life took on a parallel whereby I was trained in counter-insurgency tactics and counter-revolutionary measures to stop their eventual onslaught. Well, we were led to believe that Nelson Mandela was portrayed and portrayed to be as being a monster, a communist and a violent man. Mitchell arrived in Peter Maritzburg in 1987. He was evidently good at his job because before long he was promoted to station commander at New Hanover. Here, Mitchell served on the local joint management committee. This was a structure of the total strategy. P.W. Boerter's brainchild to counter the total onslaught from the UDF unions and the ANC itself. Trust Feed was one of the villages that fell under Brian Mitchell's command. On your arrival at New Hanover, there had not been any unrest. Yes, sir, uh, that is quite correct. In the rest of South Africa, the police were only just holding the line against an increasingly ungovernable populace. The Minister of Law and Order, Adrian Flock, took the decision to supplement the police with an auxiliary force of Kitzkonstables. These special constables were recruited from the black population, trained, armed, and put back in their communities to be used as an auxiliary or third force. They were deployed in the flashpoints or the unrest areas where the violence was... Uh, and to what would they have been attached? What so, unit or what section? The special constables. To the right unit. Captain Deonta Blanche was commander of the riot unit at Hammersdale. Along with Mitchell and the Joint Management Committee, he used these special constables to drive a lethal wedge between UDF and Inkata supporters in Trust Feed. It was just, I think, the driving force behind it, uh, behind the motives of, of uh, the security establishment was to drive the opponents, uh, the UDF, the, strong, the, the, the stronger side, um, out of trust feet. So that it is left within the hands of, say, uh, in this case, in Carter, that it becomes a no-go area and they can, within themselves, um, exist. Towards the end of 1988, Mitchell and Tablanche attended a meeting with Inkata leaders, including David Intombela, where it was decided to launch an operation that would clear and hold the trust feed area for Inkata. It was an operation that was done by myself 
entirely uh, in, in cooperation with the riot unit. There was two operations. There was an operation, a clean-up operation before yes. in the morning, and then that evening it was uh, the four special constables and myself. Who gave you the instruction to kill? Was that uh, Major Tablanche? Yes, so orders came from him that uh, these comrades must be taken out. The whole operation went wrong, where the wrong people were, became victims. The killers mistook a night vigil at an Encarta household for the UDF gathering they were supposed to attack. Relatives of the dead wept as Mitchell told how he dropped the armed men off, waited while they executed the attack, and finally how he gave the instructions for the burning of another UDF activist's house. Next morning, Mitchell helped to clean up evidence that would point to the police. But in the end, the cover-up was exposed, and Mitchell's own life was in ruins. I've lost everything in life. Well, I've subsequently been divorced. Tell us, Mr. Mitchell, when last have you seen your son? Yes. Was it several years ago that you last saw him? Yes. And okay, I think you can as well as the rest of the Although we weren't allowed to film an interview, I did manage to talk to Brian Mitchell. And during a conversation that lasted almost an hour, I felt that I had glimpsed a sincerely changed human being behind the face of this mass killer. A man who eight years ago had little or no regard for life, and for black lives in particular. A stint on death row and five years in jail has clearly given him time to reflect on what put him there. As I was leaving, he explained how he has come to understand that you reap what you sow. And he told me that for the last five years, he has been reaping what he sowed at Trust Feed. From now on, he said, he wants to sow only good things in the hope that one day he may reap good. Mr. Mitchell, are you now desirous of making amends? Yes, I am. Yes. Although it may be impossible to do it, but I am desirous of that. You've become a Christian and understand the value of forgiveness. Will you let us have your thoughts on that? Yes, I understand that forgiveness does not come cheaply. It's a, something that comes deeply from, from the heart. And I can just ask the people that were involved directly or indirectly and who have been affected by this case to consider forgiving me. The community of trust feeds has also requested me to advise the amnesty committee that they will try to forgive Mr. Brian Mitchell if he becomes actively involved in the reconstruction of the community that he was responsible for destroying. While their lawyer was clear-cut, the victims themselves still had reservations. This process is clearly hard to swallow. People don't have houses. People must get houses, they must get back to their blouses, they must get compensation. Then that would be an indication that something is being done. And I think maybe, maybe, at a long run, people will forgive and will forget. While the future of Trust Feed and the fate of Brian Mitchell still hang in the balance, the message from this week's amnesty hearing was a powerful one. It is important to know our past in order that we can move into the future. It is important that we who fought on the sides of the government should come forward and tell what happened. It is also important for those in the previous government to stand up, accept responsibility and to come forward. The Amnesty Committee must be feeling some pressure to decide the Mitchell case soon. Either way, the decision will send an important signal about truth and reconciliation to anyone considering an amnesty application.